resting period. So go ahead and make yourselves comfortable. It's good to remind ourselves right at the beginning that there's nothing we need to achieve or transcend. Right here in the context of this body and this heart in this world. This is where we learn to taste freedom. We don't need to reject any part of who we are, any aspect of this messy world. And in this simple way of remembering that there's nothing we have to do, nowhere we have to go, nothing we have to achieve or transcend or reject. We are reminding ourselves that it's possible to let go. And we learn this directly with each breath. We learn this as we receive the body on the body's terms. We learn this as we acknowledge and accept all the skillful and unskillful ways of the heart.
Looking with the simplicity of the moment. Body sensations. Sounds. Breath. Emotions. You can actually see that this isn't a passive path either. There's an engagement that we can know. And the participation that can be felt when this heart remembers to set this down. When this heart remembers to not cling. When this heart remembers to receive. And this heart recognizes that it's going down a path that perhaps is not skillful and corrects. Or maybe it's not wise to follow this fantasy all the way through. And seeing if we can feel into the steadiness that is our practice. And in moments, the heart that's content to do this work. Patient and steady, engaged. Relaxed.
This is how we train the mind. Moment by moment, breath by breath.
And opening your eyes when you're ready. Thanks for your practice, everyone. Feel free to give the body what it needs. Move around a little. Get a drink of water, use the restroom, whatever you need to do. And it's always okay and even encouraged to use the chat to say hello to each other if you'd like in the beginning. And if you want to, you can just give us an idea of how you are, maybe in a few words or a sentence, anything you're bringing with you to the evening, to the program. Just a way of showing up fully All of us learning how to take our seat. And as we bear witness to each other, each other's experience just by reading the chat and taking a minute to gaze at the room, just noticing who's here, saying hello to the Sangha, appreciating that it's nice to be in company of other practitioners. You can even try on, no demand, but try on a smile and see what that's like to look around, read the chat with a smile on your face. There we go. Some waves. <laughs> That's right, all directions. So tonight, well, let me just say, um, anybody's here for the first time, my name is Shelley Graff and one of the teachers at Common Ground and I lead this Wednesday night practice group each week. And I've been um, working through a book, this wonderful book by Tanisara and Kitasaro called Listening to the Heart, A Contemplative Journey to Engaged Buddhism. So very, very slowly, I was just kind of flipping through my notes earlier today and realizing I've given five talks on this chapter three. So this will be the sixth. So it might take us a decade to get to the book at this pace, but Hopefully the journey will be worth it. Um, yeah, and the chapters are posted on the calendar, so you don't have to buy the book if you don't want to. You can just follow along chapter by chapter. Uh, in the next few days, probably early next week, we'll post chapter four so that you have that. You can read ahead if you'd like. 
And so this chapter is written by Kitty Saro and it's called A Steady Mind. A Steady Mind, yes. And so I started last week talking about, well, we've been talking, we've been um, in conversation over the past five weeks or so about this practice and teaching of a steady mind. Um, and in particular, understanding, uh, kind of digging into a deeper understanding of the teaching of samadhi, and especially samadhi in the context of our daily lives. Since we're not many of us going on long retreat right now, um, perhaps doing some uh, more sustained practice at our homes. In fact, if you're interested, I'll be leaving, leading a half day retreat on Saturday. And so just generally speaking, I'm really interested in integration. And especially now it feels really useful to challenge ourselves to understand the teachings to, as broadly as we possibly can so that our practice really meets us where we are in our lives and individually, relationally, at this time in history, as we live communally together through, you know, this significant period. I don't know if I need to name all the ways <laughs> again, but we know what it is, right? We know what this is like. And in fact, it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult period to say the least in so many, in so many ways. One of the things that we learn through our practice is how fleeting each experience is each thought, each emotion, each oppressive mind state, and often different, different emotions or different experiences might feel like they're about to do us in, like we don't have the resiliency or the strength or the capacity to live up to what is being asked of us right now. I don't know about you, but I, I feel like this sometimes, just to be completely honest. Not, not actually like the moment it might do me in, but, but that feeling of overwhelm that can be there. Like I'm not quite sure how to move through this. I'm not sure what it takes. I'm not sure if this heart is up for the challenge. I'm not sure how far this difficult feeling will go. this despair or this hopelessness or this anger or this fear and all of the flavors. But it's precisely here that we learn how and that I'm learning how workable it is to keep practicing. It's right here where I and we realize our strength and our resiliency. It's really not in some, you know, blissful other moment that we can imagine or fantasize about. But it's right here, you know, as the relative and the ultimate kind of collide. And this is how the Buddha taught about this experience of waking up in the context of our lived experiences like we don't have to go somewhere else or we don't have to transcend this body we don't ha somehow have to escape we don't need an escape route but it's right here with all of the experiences of heart mind body that we understand what it means to be free And so we can remind ourselves of this as often as we need to, right? The Buddha lived and taught people who learned how to be free while things were difficult. Things are difficult for me. Things are difficult for you. 
things were difficult for other people throughout history. And there's lots of examples, lots of wonderful examples. I mean, endless examples of resilient humans, resilient practitioners, just resilient humans in our collective lineage, the human lineage. And we can borrow something about from them, from others, from our ancestry, from our history. And as we borrow their modeling, right, the goodness of their life, their what they've taught us, what people have taught us, what the Buddha has taught us, and others. You know, I talked about John Lewis last week, what John Lewis has taught us, what we teach each other, what our family members teach us, about how workable life is. I feel really challenged by practice in moments in, in a good way. Learning how to live responsibly and health, healthy, keep myself healthy, keep this mind healthy and balanced. And we should feel challenged by our practice because it's in this, you know, it's in the rub that we grow. It's often right here. in the grit of life and the, I don't know what to do, or I don't know how strong I am, or I don't know if I can work with this, or I don't know if how to get through this or how to show up for this. It's right here in this conflict that transformation happens, that growth is possible. And it's actually here in the midst of this conflict, we can call it conflict or challenge, we can call it grit, we can call it discomfort, pain, suffering, challenge. It's right here that we see our strength, that we learn about the steady mind, actually. And there's a pretty accessible flow of discomfort these days, <laughs> at least for me. And likely for most of us, if we're practicing wakefulness, There's a lot of uncertainty in our world. There's a stream of uh, really unpleasant, very painful experiences flowing through um, our communities that didn't begin recently, began um, ages ago, all the way back to the history of the beginning of this country that we live in here in the United States. And often, you know, this process of waking up is, is so difficult. In order to be awake, we have to confront injustice, the reality of lies and deception. The willingness in this country to sacrifice brown and black bodies for the sake of white comfort. The incompetencies of our government. And reckoning with these truths is really painful. We are unlearning habits, watching our minds and unlearning some of the habits that are there. 
like oh, the habit of comfort seeking or the habit, the habit of colluding for the sake of comfort, the habit of denying truth and being shocked by the reality of life that's in, right in front of us. The habit of knowing the truth and the pain of waking up to other people waking up. <laughs> Watching other the slow growth of the world that's catching up to the things that some of us might have known for a long time, have lived with for a long time. So it's like, you know, just like we are willing to accept and work with different emotions that might flow through the heart, anger, fear, or irritation or crankiness, or a busy mind. We may sit down to practice and our mind might be full of at the day's activities and want to just think, think, think. And just like that becomes a part of what we need to learn is workable. It's workable to accept this mind the way that it is, this busy mind the way that it is. Just like we need to and we learn to accept the body the way that it is, the imperfect bodies that we have. Just like we work to accept the conditions of our physical environment that we live in, we are also working to accept the reality and the truths of our communal experience here in the United States and around the world. So this connecting with difficulty is the work of resiliency and the kind of resiliency that's being asked of us right now is pretty deep. And so we need a lot of tools for this reckoning. We need a lot of tools. We need to be able to understand when to use different practices, which teachings to call on, which strategies to take part in. We need to learn how to balance the mind and offer comfort when it's useful and skillful, not as a default habit, but when it's actually the best medicine, right? We need to, because it's good for balance of heart and good for balance of mind, allowing us to continue to engage the work of transformation. And we need to know when it's right to allow the discomfort just to be there and feel into it in all of the way that the heart kind of maneuvers to reject what's not comfortable, what's not pleasant. Because it's as we do that work of <clears throat> attending to the discomfort that the discomfort tends to be less and less scary. We learn that we are resilient and that we can <clears throat> sit right in the truth. And as we learn to sit in the truth, then the steadiness of mind becomes suffused in the bot with the body and the steadiness of which we might call the suffusion of energies, body, mind, speech, become more reliable for us. And so this practice of samadhi the unification or collectedness of the mind is what we might call the, the steadiness. I like the steady mind. I like that description because it feels really regular to me. It doesn't feel like something that I need to uh, understand with much, much sophistication. We know when our minds feel steady we know when our heart, when, you know, this, our whole being feels like we can uh, 
engage in our life in consistent, regular, steady ways. You know, when, when we feel like we can accept what's happening, all the changes and disruptions, you know, in ordinary ways, we can see this. Wake up in the morning, we have a plan, things don't go as planned in the first 15 minutes and we have to adjust. We were gonna have toast and we realized there's no more bread and so we choose oatmeal and we were gonna take a walk, but then the phone rings and it's an important phone call. So you decide to do that instead. And then you have three appointments scheduled at the same time and feel disappointed that you have to, oh, this is my life. Um, I feel upset that I have to uh, break the hard news to, that I made a scheduling error. <laughs> Say, I'm sorry, feel bad about that, ask for some forgiveness. But this is how it goes, right? So we learn how to, right here in the midst of our ordinary lives, start to feel into the flow of connection, of effort, of this willingness to be with it, to not have to avoid it. Just to go, oh yeah, it's like this. It, it sucks to feel guilty. It sucks to feel sad. It doesn't feel great to be distracted. It doesn't feel great to want something I can't have. It doesn't feel great to not want this. But each time this heart can learn how to just keep going. Like, yep, it doesn't feel great, but look at that. This heart is feeling that. Uh-huh. There's some steadiness that's established moment by moment. I was listening to a, a talk by Tana Chodron today. And she was um, talking about just how she might describe practice. And she said something like, it's about working with your own patterns. And her suggestion was to train ourselves to be strong, resilient, and compassionate so that we can be steady and be able to be of benefit in difficult times. So our practice in ordinary moments strengthens our resiliency and our compassionate heart in the midst of some simplicity and some neutral moments almost. Not always quite neutral, but you know, some not very charged moments, like accepting oatmeal instead of bread for breakfast. Now that's not too hard, but it is hard to accept murder of people daily. That's hard. And so we practice understanding, accepting how things are so that we have a fighting chance and participating, right? And in, in, in an engaged way, like, oh, how do I participate? How do I stay engaged? How do I feel the discomfort and continue to move with it? Allow this heart to move in compassionate ways so that when we get to the big things, we have a fighting chance of knowing how to do it there. so that we don't only have one move, and that's to seek comfort and to avoid. That's not what this moment is calling us to do. This moment is really calling us forward, right? With some steadiness. Calling us for a more nuanced engagement. And so each of these moments where it feels like, oh, this is unworkable, yes. Let's ask our practice to meet us right here in what feels unworkable. So we gain strength, we gain resiliency right here. And then we take that show on the road with us into all of the things that we do, into all of the ways that the world needs us right now, needs our participation.
The Buddha said, just as a Rocky Mountain is not moved by storms, so sights, sounds, taste, smells, contacts, and ideas, whether desirable or undesirable, will never stir one of steady nature, whose mind is firm and free. Firm and free. So this exploration of samadhi or a steady mind is really enlivening for me right now. And not in the way that uh, I'm looking for answers, but just enjoying the effort of inquiry, like continuing to ask like, oh, what is this? What does this really mean? And so we can take this inquiry with us in this very simple statement that the Buddha makes. Just as a rocky mountain is not moved by storms, so all of, of our sensory experience, including our thoughts and ideas and contacts, whether we like them or not, will never disturb our steady nature, whose mind is firm and free. So firm, I take to mean steady, and free, I might take to mean relaxed or spacious. So steady, firm, this willingness to be here in strong ways, in fierce ways, in engaged and participatory ways, and also relaxed so that the engagement flows naturally and so that we don't burn out. Right. The energies of the, the energies that support steadiness can be strong. And with our steadiness, we should be able to track the usefulness of the energies that are here with us. Right. So for example, anger can sometimes get a bad rap. Anger can get a bad rap, not because it's a, a bad thing, because anger is a natural human emotion, but because often as anger arises in our hearts, it becomes quickly becomes an uncontrollable force and our only option is to react, right? So anger takes us for a ride and then we behave in ways that aren't skillful. But the energy of anger that is welcomed and can be understood, connected with, met, practiced with, understood, and carefully engaged with is perhaps the energy of fierceness that we need for our participatory engagement in the world. And this from the Dalai Lama. Generally, we can define destructive emotions as those states which undermine our well-being by creating inner turmoil, thereby undermining self-control and depriving of us of mental freedom. Within this, it is also, also possible to distinguish between two subcategories, those emotional states that are destructive in themselves, such as greed, hatred, or malice, and those states such as attachment, anger, or fear, which only become destructive when their intensity is disproportionate to the situation in which they arise. Well, that's something to practice with. So you've probably heard that anger is a natural response to injustice, right? So the fierceness, the strength that's often, the energy that's often needed to confront injustice is, is strong, right? And so we want to be able to, in moments when it feels unpleasant and uncomfortable, to connect with our own sense of fierceness or anger or fear. And if we're constantly pushing it away in search of our own comfort, then we're never going to really understand our, or have full access to all of the energies that we need to take care of ourselves and each other. So this is careful territory, no doubt but this is what we signed up for as practitioners, right? 
right? <laughs> we sign up to right in the middle of our messy minds and hearts and relationships, understand, learn, learn something, understand, grow, and find out how our lives are workable right here with awareness and love, right? With awareness and love. How are our lives workable with awareness and love? And so we have to be willing to meet ordinary experiences, and this is an ordinary experience. Anger is not avoidable. So I've been talking about some of the, in the last few talks I've given, just uh, people in our world who have modeled for us something really useful for our times. Last week I talked some about John Lewis and um, then on Saturday a little bit about a really important spiritual teacher for me, Nikki Giovanni. And tonight um, I wanted to mention Nelson Mandela. So of course there are friends, we have friends, we have people we know that will do the same thing, model what it's like to be fiercely compassionate and engaged and steady and competent, right? The sign of competency, the steadiness of mind that is the sign of a competent heart that can feel what's flowing and actually stay with it so that our capacity to respond is there rather than only kind of being taken for a ride by our emotions. And I found this little story um, about Nelson Mandela. I rem you know, I have this remember that many, many times he was asked about anger. You know, he spent 27 years in prison and well, didn't you get angry? And I can remember some of the some of his res responses, but I was looking for a direct found this um, article. And I'll just read a piece of it. When he was president of the United States, Bill Clinton had a conversation with Nelson Mandela when he was president of South Africa. Years earlier, Clinton woke his family at three in the morning to watch the press coverage of this historic day that meant Mandela was released from prison. As the television cameras pressed on, Clinton observed the sheer anger and hatred on Mandela's face as he walked from his cell block to the front of the prison. Then, in a heartbeat, Mandela's rage seemed to vanish. When Clinton asked the South African president about it, Mandela replied, I'm surprised that you saw that, and I regret that the cameras caught my anger. Yes, you are right. When I was in prison, the son of a guard started a Bible study that I attended. That day, when I stepped out of prison and looked at the people observing, a flush of anger hit me with the thought that they had robbed me of 27 years. Then the spirit of Jesus said to me, Nelson, while you were in prison, you were free. Now that you are free, don't become a prisoner. A couple of things that I really appreciate about that. One is the nimbleness of mine, right? that doesn't have to deny the expression of a normal human emotion. And this competence of a heart that's cultivated steadiness to be able to let it go. Anger arose, anger passed away, just like that in the matter of a moment. The competency of the heart, when steadiness, when samadhi, when this ability to be intimate with the regular and the ordinary and the very difficult, when the steadiness is cultivated, 
we become much bigger, much stronger, and much more resilient. We, come, we become this rock that's able, the steadiness that the Buddha talked about, the steadiness of the, the rock as, you know, the firmness, both the firmness and the relaxed, that spaciousness, that steadiness there with a lot of space to, to welcome all the difficult experiences of our lives. And it's in this welcoming spirit, this heart that welcomes, that we learn how to engage moment by moment and for the long haul. So I'm curious what it's like to hear my reflections. I'm curious about how you have worked with this territory over the past several months or today or last week. How you know your own resiliency, what you're learning about yourself as you're practicing, balancing, rebalancing the mind finding some steadiness, falling off your square, finding some steadiness again, as you're practicing with the, ter the territory of normal human emotions. There's no denying that even very well-practiced people, Dharma teachers and lots of smart, wise, compassionate humans are afraid at times right now, are angry at times right now, feel despair, and also feel our nimbleness. So what's that been like for you? What have you learned about yourself? What are you learning about yourself right now? What are you curious about? Um, and say your name for us, if you would. Greg, I'm hey, Greg. Okay. Hey, Greg. Uh, this is timely for me um, because I'm uh, I've been participating with a group of people in in advocating for a Mexican national who was deported uh, this morning. Uh, and it, it's I don't want to make this too long of a story, but um, I uh, sent them out on an airplane this morning at nine o'clock. This is after holding him for six months in detention. And he leaves his uh, wife and children behind and uh, they wouldn't let him take anything with him. I mean, so here he is in an orange jumpsuit and shackles and handcuffs and they sent him on a plane to Matamoros. And so, yeah, I'm angry. And um, it's hard to let that go. Um, I care about this. I don't know him personally. I just know of him through this group I've been volunteering with him. Um, but, I, you know, it's like, I want to fix this. And I'm not sure how to let go of that. I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Yes. What's his name, Greg? You're muted. It's Gregorio. 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 Like Greg, only Gregorio. Yeah. We got to stick together. Thank you.
Hi, this is Robert. Robert. And uh, I wanted to thank Greg for that, <clears throat> that uh, story because uh, every time I hear the plight of um, immigrants in today's society, I'm always reminded that I'm an immigrant who got here, uh, well, a first generation sort of immigrant because my family came from elsewhere, from the Caribbean, as it turned out to be. And that um, as I went to Ellis Island and dug up the records, you know, I got the manifest list of all the people that came at the same time and they were coming from all over the world. And um, for us to forget that we are a nation of immigrants, um, I think it's just a, a really unfortunate thing. Um, so I thank Greg for his work um, with, with Gregorio and I will try to remember him in my thoughts and prayers. Thanks, Robert. My name's Tracy. Tracy. Um, thanks, everybody. I had, um, I, I have two, two thoughts. One um, that I, that I feel like I'm learning about more and more, especially just during this time, is how to show up It feels like and be be involved, be intimate with um, what's happening. Um, there's a lot of pain in, in the work I do. There's a lot of trauma and it's um, worse right now. And I just realize how much um, normally I think it's like I have sort of this deal with life like I'm going to show up um, provided it turns out the way I want you know and it's never true but right now it's just so clear that it's like the being being in it no matter the outcome like like I have I know some people right now who who have COVID who know someone who's dying from it, you know, it's, that's just one thing. And how to um, stay connected, even as that's happening for them, for me, with them, despite how it's, how it turns out. And like, you could just say this about like everything. And it's just interesting to be learning about that. It's like, there's, it's, it's so clear. And then the other, the other piece was, you know, when you were talking about anger, I just in the sit tonight, it's so interesting to see how I had this moment um, where there was, there was like this thought of self-hatred and then there was this rage. And I realized like on the path, I think if I were doing this right, I wouldn't have that. Like there's some part of that that shows up. And, and when the rage was just there, there was also this equanimity. It was like, well, of course, and compassion. Well, of course there's rage. And honestly, I don't even, it's about everything. It's just like this shooting out rage, just this energy of the rage. And just being with that, it felt really energizing. And it didn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't even like hatred. It was just like energy and the not connecting to that was a, sort of a deadening. So I just felt like more present. And anyway, so those are my thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Tracy.
Don't be shy. I'm not even sure which teacher said this um, at this point, but one of the things that I remember someone saying is to it that it's okay to condemn the behavior, not the person. So I'm just reading this um, Mary's offering in the chat. I almost always go to the to feeling bad when I get angry about the violent and unjust actions being taken by our government and law enforcement. It's only later that I remember that these experience are my practice. Yeah. So just one, you know, bit of support for me has been to just be willing to see clearly that actions, some actions are just simply not skillful, very hurtful, violent, inhumane, you know, being willing to call actions what they are. That's a part of my practice and seeing clearly. And then also trusting that if I believe in my own capacity to transform unskillful habits into skillful habits, whether in this lifetime or the next, then I certainly have to believe in the potential of all human beings. So again, I'm not sure what path we are each on, like how long that will take, but I do, I see directly that it's possible, that it's often possible for this heart to an, abide in kind awareness. So it's possible for this heart to be full of compassion rather than to act out my neurotic, angry, whatever kind of habits. You know, it's possible. I know that directly because I wa I'm watching that happen right here in my own life. And I know the capacity that's growing for this heart to be good. I can feel that. So I can trust that that is possible for others. It doesn't mean that, you know, I condone bad behavior or I allow people to get close who might actually hurt me. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that we're, we're smart, right? And we take skillful responses. We can participate, we can protest, we can advocate, we can get involved to put a stop to the ways that human beings perpetuate harm and still at the same time believe in the transformative potential of the heart. And I don't know about you, but sometimes you can see this happen. You know, when uh, I just got a very small thing, but a good friend gave me some direct feedback, like, oh, when you say that, I feel like this. And, um, and I, it, it landed really directly in the heart and I felt bad not felt guilty, but I, it was like a Hiriotapa moment. Like, I, I don't want to do that to you. I don't want to say the thing that's going to cause you to feel that way. But it was because of that direct pointing that she offered me, right? So it's, I don't know when that's going to happen for other people. So we have to be willing to directly point to the problematic behavior in the world and others and our government and the systems and the humans and ourselves and each other that perpetuate harm that is skillful or can be skillful because at some point at some point we might be able to make good on that offering right just like i can make good on the offering my friend gave me like, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm going to remember that. I remember the way it felt in the heart. It was sort of like a dropping um, and a heaviness and a kind of an uplifting after that. Like, oh, I don't want to, I love you. I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to forget that. I'm going to try not to say that in that way anymore. 
So that possibility exists in the human heart, with this human heart, right here for me, for you, for everyone in this lifetime, right now in this moment, and perhaps some of us won't learn for a long time and that's okay because we might need a lot of practice. As may some of our government officials. It doesn't mean that we stop trying. Time for one more short comment if someone has something. I'll try to make it really fast. Hey, um, hi. Um, yeah, my name is Tony. Um, so much of the time, though, this anger comes up for me precisely on the flip side of this, when this, when I see either myself or others do this turning away, not not choosing the to to recognize suffering or to to make the opening choice to to instead close down and that and and when it seems like that uh that choice is the dominant choice in uh the world <laughs> uh when our president <laughs> is uh has is con seems consumed by it uh etc um and and when you know you have i have family members or or other people i talk to who um you know whatever that anger like i feel that anger projected and i also feel it internally at myself whenever I've for for when I make that choice and it's so hard to sit in that anger because it feels like it's I mean because it's never going away how and and I don't have how do you <laughs> deal with that mm. and I, I don't expect there to be an answer here but <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, that deserves a, a longer conversation. Um, and tomorrow, on Thursday mornings, I have practice, a, a group practice meeting. Anybody can show up. And every other week, we tackle the topic of um, racial injustice. And so 9 to 10, if anybody wants to come and have a conversation, that would be a great, that would be a great question to bring. Thanks, Tony. And it's nine o'clock now. So I'm wondering if I could ask my friend Patrice to dedicate the merit for us again. Thank you. One of my favorite, favorite Buddhist practices is mm -hmm. practice of imaginative generosity in which we can include everyone. So If there is any merit to our practice tonight, any goodness, any benefit from coming together in this beloved community, we would happily, joyfully, gladly share it with our parents, our teachers, friends, coworkers, all the beings we've interacted with today, this past week, this past year, this past life. And we can extend it to all the beings we may never get to know, beings throughout the world, offering them whatever goodness has come our way, happily sharing it with them. And let's share our merit with Gregorio tonight too, and Gregorio's family. Mm. 
May all beings be at ease. May all beings be safe and protected. And ultimately, may all beings be liberated and find that great joy. Thank you, Patrice. Thanks, everybody. Have a great, engaging, enlivening week. Hope to see many of you next week.